the dumb ditzy blonde, uh, a sort of modern incarnation of Venus, uh, the urban Venus, the megalopolis Venus. And people were only interested in that, and it became the tragic agon of her life, and she ended up dying uh, as a result of this struggle uh, to get, you know, this competition with her own avatar. But that said, that's the basic celebrity myth, and that paved the way for the rest of us now, where we have the democratization of the celebrity myth via uh, YouTube, via the internet, uh, you know, via all this other stuff, which enables the average person now to undergo that process and find out what it's like, you know, the eerie effect of seeing yourself on YouTube, for example. It's a little strange. Yeah, um, that's for sure. <laughs> so it's, I guess, just to add an extra question uh, to this one. Um, this this seems to be another pattern where there's like a centralizing force and then a decentralizing force, um, and it's just amazing even thinking that the celebrity was sort of like the centralized version of everybody on YouTube and everybody on Facebook and everything. Uh, fascinating. Um, I guess. You know what, we'll save that for the Facebook question, though, because I wanted to actually uh, squeeze in the um, question about Wikipedia. So, um, so you, you, in the book you say it's not a real encyclopedia. It's um, actually inducing a kind of knowledge crisis. Can you like uh, explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, the problem with Wikipedia, uh, its tagline says it's the free encyclopedia, which is great because mm -hmm. I love encyclopedias and I hate the Encyclopedia Britannica not because of its content, but because of its weight. No, you know, every time when I used to have an encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, when, when moving, it was the one lumbering elephant that I didn't want to carry around with me. So I eventually cut it loose. And now I'm grateful that uh, you know, if you go online to Encyclopedia Britannica, you have to pay a fee to look look something up. And I'm not fond of that. So I do like the fact that w Wikipedia makes all of this so-called knowledge available. And it functions analogously to an encyclopedia, but the problem with it is, is that it's based on an epistemology that completely eliminates the idea of an encyclopedia. An encyclopedia uh, traditionally is a store of knowledge. It says, here is the body of knowledge of our civilization. It's fixed. It can't be tampered with. Uh, and what is true today isn't going to cease to be true tomorrow. Or if that does happen, we'll have a record of it so that you can read about the evolution. You know how. Uh, the Earth was once considered flat. Now it's nowadays we think it's round, but the articles are still there. All the information is stored in there. Now the problem with Wikipedia touting itself as an encyclopedia is that it's an unstable database. So that when you go in and if you read an article about, let's say, I want to read something about Napoleon and a fact that's on there that has been disputed by someone else who has decided to go in and delete that fact, and then I look the article up again a little while later and that fact is gone. Well, then we have an unstable knowledge base, and that's not an encyclopedia. It's, it's, um, it's an epistemological crisis, because what it does is it turns knowledge into something that is more the status of a rumor. Rumors change, uh, and they, they transform as they pass from mouth to mouth until they become so exaggerated that you can no longer tell what's true and what isn't. So Wikipedia is a sort of folkloric collection of rumors about knowledge. This is what the popular consciousness thinks might be true, what they think the elite might think is now true, and uh, somebody else might disagree with it, so it may stop being true in a few minutes. So it's very bizarre. It's not, you can't build a civilization on an unstable database. It doesn't work. And the prophet of this, of course, was uh, Jorge Luis Borges in his uh, short stories where he wrote about phantom databases with um, vast armies of multiple authors who could go in and, and write things with, uh, without necessarily signing their names to them. Hmm. Uh, he was the prophet of, of the Wikipedia catastrophe. It's a sort of knowledge catastrophe. Yeah, that's, um, I can't even imagine how. Um, well, is there is there any benefit to having a kind of like, uh, to have knowledge in a flux state? Is there any benefit um, or potential maybe for collective intelligence, you think? Or is this really not proven itself yet? Well, coll I mean, collective intelligence is an oxymoron, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, uh, there, there is no such thing. Intelligence is always worked out by an elite. Mm. But I will say this, that um, I do use Wikipedia like everybody else does, and it does have its uses, one of which is that you, if you want to know something quickly, you can look it up and you can see what the popular consciousness thinks is true right now. Chances are in a lot of cases it's, it's going to be okay, but you can't use it as a citation and, and just stop there. You have, mm. to, you have to take that fact and then go cross-check it with traditional media and see if it stands up to it. In many cases, I've come across examples from Wikipedia which 
you know, just didn't stand up. Once I went and second checked the sources, uh, I found out that this no, this is not true at all. But a, a lot of times, uh, what you look up will will turn out to be the case. So it it does you know it, it does function as a sort of uh, temporary bridge to getting facts quickly. Mm. Okay, um, I guess well, just uh, just keep in mind the caveat that they may not be facts. Right. So there's always this degree of uncertainty. So uh, okay. Um, so I guess going back to uh, Facebook. Um, it's supposed to be helping us all socialize. This is another thing that everybody talks about. Um, Facebook's this great thing, and we're all talking to each other, but um, as you mentioned, um, it's not really um, um, so much of a, an extension of our sociability as it is a, a replacement for something that's missing that's offline. Nobody talks to each other anymore in suburbia. So uh, could you go into that a little bit and maybe also explain why it is that uh, Facebook might be dehumanizing us by flattening us, as we were mentioning before, into these two-dimensional avatars? Yes. Um, the popularity of Facebook, uh, I've come to the conclusion that, and it may not be necessarily the right conclusion, but that um, the, the kinds of communication that appear on Facebook are what... Uh, communication series of term phatic communication, uh, mm. P-H-A-T-I-C. Phatic communication is communication that's just sociable. It doesn't have any other purpose. It doesn't, its purpose is not to convey knowledge or, or valuable information or anything necessary. Uh, it's just sociable. You create a sociable atmosphere. So normally in traditional city life, uh, a, a phatic atmosphere is what would happen when you would walk up the street in a neighborhood and you see you know, five or ten people that you know, that know you, you say hello to them, you go into the cafe, you have coffee, coffee uh, you walk back, and uh, you talk to the people in your neighborhood. And there are lots of people out on the streets walking around, bumping into each other. Uh, you meet an old friend, they introduce you to the three other people you've never seen. They're just coming back from a movie. Well, now that world of community, and I know that world of community because it's fossilized in San Francisco, and I lived in San Francisco for five years uh, in North Beach, and I had a taste of what that is like to have an actual community because I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, where there there is no such thing as, as a community, and I've never had the experience of walking down the street being greeted by anyone on the streets of Phoenix, uh, which is a frightening idea of a city. I, it's, you know, the, the original idea of a city is where uh, strangers, admittedly, could <clears throat> come into contact with each other, and you would have social buffers uh, that would make the contact uh, pleasant, and then, uh, but some of the people, of course, you would know. But in our megalopolitan cities, we don't have anything like that. So neighborhoods and communities are disappearing. The cities are decentralizing as the result of urban sprawl, which is, of course, as Jane Jacobs pointed out, the result of the automobile the dictating to city planners how cities should be laid out, and they become more and more decentralized. And, of course, Victor Gruen's creation of the shopping mall uh, created many city centers around which strip malls and post offices and so forth and suburbs resituated themselves. So you have this decentralizing effect of... Uh, you know, this monadology of communities, and uh, they're not even really communities because nobody knows anybody anymore. And if you want to go to a coffee shop, you have to get in your car and drive five miles to the nearest coffee shop, which is, of course, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So with the disappearance of community with phatic neighborhoods, um, Facebook recaptures this and provides for people uh, a community of sociability. You don't necessarily need to have any kind of depth relationships with any of these people. Uh, in fact, if you don't, it's better. The reality is that the type of friend, Facebook redefines the word friend, these friends are not real friends, not usually anyway, because the fact of the matter is you already know what your real friends think. You've been emailing them, you've been talking to them on the phone, you don't need to say hello to them on Facebook. Facebook is a long distance telescope for viewing strangers uh, and, and tunneling, filtering them through a sort of safety valve where you can meet strangers without all these other pressures and you can say hello to them and, and talk to them. Uh, so it does provide a, an interesting social service. But these are not real friends. These aren't people you would trust with your intimate life secrets. They're not people that you would uh, tell your woes to. I've made the mistake once or twice of doing that and noticed instantly that uh, uh, the, the person won't talk to you again. And that's happened a couple of times. So uh, it, the essence of a friendship is sharing intimate woes and sufferings. The friend is the person who's always going to listen to that. Facebook friends are absolutely turned off by that. They, they turn the other cheek and go the other way the moment you make any kind of personal confessions. So the whole system is inimical to any traditional ideas of friendship, just the way Wikipedia is completely inimical to the idea of an encyclopedia, just as the Internet is utterly hostile to all traditional forms of media. So Facebook 
uh, consistent with the Internet's hostility to traditional media is also itself hostile to all traditional conceptions of friendship, uh, but it does retrieve the, you know, the neighborhood hello. So I, I suppose it serves a function uh, that's valuable. Uh, but it's just sad to see, you know, uh, neighborhoods and communities disappearing and that people flock uh, online to substitute for what should be three-dimensional encounters, these little two-dimensional icons. I, I think it's kind of sad, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess for the second part, um, so it's it's kind of just flattening us into these, like, uh, two-dimensional images with, like, uh, I don't know, um, basic information like age, birth, you know that sort of thing. Um, so it's, there's nothing, there's nothing three-dimensional about the interactions, which is interesting. But um, I mean, yeah, they're, 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 uh, it, it turns people into electronic trading cards. I don't know. <laughs> you may be too young. I don't even know if baseball cards are still around. Uh, but that's basically what they are. This, these are electronic. What it does is turns people into electronic baseball cards because the traditional baseball card, you have the the photo of the guy on the front. You flip the card over, and there's all his batting statistics and his averages and all the necessary data for him to collect him as a sports icon. Facebook does the same thing to people electronically, but it's a total flattening out. It turns people into cards. Mm. All right. Um, well, I guess to move on to... Sorry, let's see. Yeah, we have a little bit. Um, it's only been half an hour. That's good. Um, so the next question, um, gadgets like the iPod or the laptop you say you're actually uh, breaking up the community um, and not creating more coherency. Um, so we're getting these Leibnizian monads and microcosms. Um, the electric age has a decentralizing effect. But as McLuhan says, modernity may unify, but it also homogenizes. So um, I guess my question is leading up to it, everything we've been saying. Um, could decentralization ultimately lead to a more complex ecology of communities if it evolves beyond where it is right now? Well, I don't think there's any way to predict what's going to happen because we're involved in a, in a vast experiment here. All these new media are experiments, and that's sort of uh, the predisposition of Western civilization that makes it different from all the other civilizations in history is its wonderful pell-mell predisposition to try anything new. And uh, there's a myth that, that's to that. It's the myth of the wonder child, and you can trace the... Uh, the evolution of this myth going back into the Greeks, uh, Achilles is in many ways the first wonder child. He's the youngest of all the Greek warriors. Um, he's too, he's so young, in fact, he's something like uh, 20, 21, 22, that uh, he's too young to have made the pledge 10 years ago <coughs> to avenge uh, uh, Helen's, uh, if Helen were ever abducted, uh, all the other Greek heroes made a vow that they would go and avenge that abduction. Well, he, he would have been way too young to make that vow. So there's a suspicion that he's been added in here, that he was not original to whatever the uh, Homeric uh, scholars, uh, poets rather, had in mind when they mm -hmm. created the epic. So he's an add-in, and um, what he symbolizes, and especially his conflict with Agamemnon there at the beginning over this girl that Agamemnon uh, has stolen from him, it isn't a conflict over a girl, it's the conflict between youth and the elders, the wonder child versus the elders. And the elders are the guardians of the archetypes of a society, the guardians of its ancient social forms. Their job is to say no. And that really is all their job. It's somewhat similar to the job of academics nowadays, which is to say no to any new ideas. That's their job. They guard uh, the proverbial wisdom and tradition of a, of a society and prevent it from changing. So that if a change does take place, it has to fight its way in and therefore will be an absolutely necessary one. So only the necessary changes are allowed to get through because of the resistance put up by the elders. Well, that resistance was weakening uh, amongst the Greeks so that already in the, uh, the 8th century, you've got all these new phenomena coming in, the Olympic Games, new temples, new gods, uh, all these new phenomena are, that have never happened before in Greek civilization coming in, the actual writing down of the epics themselves. And then so by the time you get down to Plato uh, and Aristotle, Plato is turning his back on uh, the traditional media such that he doesn't even allow poets in the Republic, he doesn't even allow poets into his ideal utopia because, mm -hmm. basically because, uh, you know, the poets are the traditional oral bards. They're the ones who carry the knowledge encyclopedia, the sort of Wikipedias of the time. They carry them inside their heads and uh, that knowledge was proverbial. Well, in the time of Socrates and Plato, that knowledge was being diced up by the analytical intellect. The individual was being detribalized, cut free of tribal tra traditions and instead of um, when confronted with a problem where the individual would just spout a proverbial